Good afternoon or good morning to those in Western states. My name is Leah Sakala and I'm a senior policy associate at the Urban Institute and I'm honored to be the moderator for today's discussion on racial impact statements and justice policy reform. Before we start, I'd like to quickly run through some housekeeping details. First, this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterwards. Second, speaker biographies are available online at urban.org and a link to the bios will be posted in the chat. Third, we have closed captions turned on and if you'd like to adjust your settings, just click on the live transcription button at the bottom. Fourth, all participants are muted, but you can send us questions or comments in the Q&A box at any time. So please do, and we'll hope to have enough time for audience Q&A at the end. And finally, if you tweet about the event, which we also encourage you to do, please use the hashtag live at urban. Now with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get started. We're having this conversation today, first and foremost, because it is an undeniable fact that the US criminal legal system has roots deep in racialized policymaking. Organizers and scholars alike have long documented the explicit and implicit ways that racism shapes the legal system with profound consequences that fall most heavily on black and brown communities. Racial and ethnic disparities grow as justice system involvement deepens, beginning with over-policing and growing through risk of arrest, risk of incarceration, sentencing severity, and post-release opportunity. And these inequities are linked directly to policy choices. Now, some topics in criminal justice policymaking are now infamous for perpetuating racially disparate outcomes, such as the 100 to 1 crack versus powder cocaine penalty disparity in federal sentencing, which disproportionately affected Black people convicted of drug offenses, and which has since been reduced but not yet eliminated. And another example is the New York City Police's unconstitutional use of stop and frisk. Many more policies and practices at the local, state, and federal levels contribute to unjust outcomes in subtler ways, however, which in the aggregate lead to the wildly disparate outcomes that we see for Black, Brown, and Indigenous people in the U.S. legal system in comparison with their white counterparts. Last year, we saw an unprecedented national uprising against police violence that re-emphasized the urgency of addressing racism in our criminal legal system head on. This fueled conversations around the country about how to build and grow safety systems that work for everyone. And a critical piece of this process is making sure that we evaluate proposed changes to public safety policy from a racial justice perspective. This intentionality is the goal of racial impact statements. Like environmental or fiscal impact statements, racial impact statements are tools used in policymaking to determine whether pending bills or other policy proposals, if enacted, are likely to create or widen disparate outcomes among people of different races or ethnicities. 10 states currently have racial impact statement policies or processes in place for evaluating justice policy changes, and several local jurisdictions do as well. And we have a lot to learn from the variety across these approaches, and I'm very much looking forward to the critical and timely conversation that we're about to have here. Our four panelists will share their perspectives and experiences as policymakers, researchers, and advocates who have advanced and studied racial impact statement policies. I'm honored to be joined today by four um, wonderful guests, the first of whom is former Iowa State Representative Wayne Ford, who authored landmark legislation in 2008, making Iowa the first state in the nation to require a minority impact statement with respect to both new criminal laws and state contracts. Mr. Ford also serves as an advisory board member for Urban's Prison Research and Innovation Initiative, and he's the founder and CEO of the Wayne Ford Equity Impact Institute, and you'll hear more on that in a little bit. Second, we have Maryland Delegate Jazz Lewis, who represents the 24th Legislative District in Maryland's House of Delegates, and is a candidate for Maryland's 4th Congressional District. In Annapolis, he serves as the chairman of the Democratic Caucus, and as a legislator, Delegate Lewis has worked on issues ranging from criminal justice reform, healthcare access, food security, and Maryland's economy. Delegate Lewis was the sponsor for racial impact analysis in the General Assembly, and the analysis is currently in a pilot program and has been conducted on issues within the criminal justice sphere. 
Delegate Lewis hopes to expand the program to other issue areas to create a wider breadth of knowledge on crucial racial equity issues. Third, we have Nicole Porter, who is the Senior Director of Advocacy at the Sentencing Project, where she manages efforts on sentencing reform, voting rights, and eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Her advocacy has supported criminal justice reforms in several states, including Kentucky, Missouri, and California. Ms. Porter was named a new civil rights leader by Essence Magazine for her work to eliminate mass incarceration. And fourth, we have Tracy Tucker, who is the Youth Justice Leadership Institute Coordinator at the National Juvenile Justice Network, which is a program to develop leaders of color within the field of youth justice reform with the National Juvenile Justice Network. Ms. Tucker is an alum of the Institute and previously served on the Board and Membership Advisory Council. Prior to her work at NJJN, she worked as the state policy manager and raised the age South Carolina coordinator with the Campaign for Youth Justice, advocating for youth justice reform efforts in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We are so fortunate to have these distinguished guests with us today, and please join me in virtually welcoming our panelists. I'd like to um, kick off the discussion today um, by first um, turning to you, Mr. Ford. Could you please share a little bit about how and why you championed the first racial impact statement legislation in Iowa, and also what we can learn from that initial effort? Thank you very much, Leah. And it's a, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, behind me is the capital city of Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. A lot of people make jokes about Iowa. A lot of people make jokes about Des Moines. And I got that. So for all the people out there, yes, if there is a city that's not a farm. We got a city here. And originally I'm from Washington, DC and a city and I grew up, you know, back in the sixties and I was fortunate enough to get a football scholarship to come to Iowa and play football. I stayed here. Some years ago, around 2001, the sentencing project did a report. It said two places in America had the highest incarceration of blacks. Number, number one was the state of Iowa. Number two was my hometown of Washington, DC. I said, that got to be impossible. You don't have that many blacks in Iowa. I was a state legislator about 2008 when this came out. And I said to myself, I got to do something about it. I knew Washington DC because I'm, I'm from DC, I got that. But being the only black legislator in the state of Iowa at that time and recognizing Iowa by the research from the sentencing project has such an astronomical number, I could not believe it. So I got on my horse with my telephone and I called Mr. Mark Meyer, who's retired now, the legendary, and I mean legendary, uh, you know, director from the sentencing project. And I confronted him, I called him out. I said, I think your, your, your numbers don't make sense. I understand DC being number two in black incarceration, but why, how, how in the world can Iowa, uh, the fifth white state in America? He said, Representative Ford, come to my office. I came to his office in Washington, DC. He showed me the facts and the fact speaks for himself. So I asked him a question. Mark, what can I do about it? He kind of looked at me, his eyes kind of got big. You know, here I'm a, by myself, black legislator, but he didn't, he didn't know me. He said, what can I do about it? He said, Representative Ford, there is some, there's a minority impact statement movement. There's some language that if we can get this language, now remember now, this is many years ago. If we can get this language going, we think we can start a movement. It's a minority impact statement language, which means before the governor signs a bill, it goes through a process, yes, but before the governor signs a bill, he or she would know how it will help minorities, not help minorities, help, help females, help disabled. In other words, the governor signs a bill, they will know if I sign this bill, 20% minorities are going to prison. They can't use that as an excuse anymore. I said, Mark, can you help me work on the language? I was fortunate enough to be in charge of a nonprofit called Urban Dreams, which I recently retired. So I flew Mark out here. Uh, we traveled the whole city together. We met legislators. We met the governor. And before Mark left, he said, Representative Ford, I'm going to put some language together for you. We got that language together. And in 2008, uh, Governor Chet Culver became the first governor in America in the fifth whitest state in America to sign the bill, the minority impact statement legislation. And I'm very happy about that. So it started because we had a perfect time and a perfect storm and you had legislators or, or people to doing it that can make a change. A couple more messages. One person can make a difference. I speak highly about that because you saw what I just did. But more than that, we started a movement. 
And right now I'm so happy that, that I have lived long enough. I retired. I retired uh, four or five years ago. I'm, 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 I'm going into my seventies. So, you know, I'm an old man now, that's okay. But the bottom line is this, we are still a movement because one thing I thought about, if I can do it, then others can do it. I'm very happy that Connecticut was number two, uh, Oregon was number three, and New Jersey was number four, and the beat is going on. And I know about Merlin and the pilot project. So we got a movement. I'm glad we got a big crowd. I'm just happy to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, um, for that background, Mr. Ford. And actually building on that, um, Ms. Porter, I'd like to turn to you next because you have done extensive research on different approaches to racial impact statement legislation on the state and local levels since Iowa's inaugural legislation. And so I'd love to hear from you. Um, why have other state and local governments chosen to follow in Iowa's footsteps? And could you please describe a little bit about um, what have their approaches looked like? Yeah, thank you so much, Leah. Thank you for inviting me to participate and thank you to the Urban Institute for hosting this important discussion. It's always great to hear from Mr. Ford and the, um, the start to racial impact statements and it, you know, getting started in Iowa. I think since then, a number of states have adopted racial impact statements. We're gonna hear later from Maryland Delegate Jazz Lewis and um, other states have enacted rules authorizing racial impact statements. Um, you know, this year alone, three states, uh, including Maryland, enacted racial impact statements as a policy. I think in many ways that was because of the time. You know, we came into, the, we came into this year inspired by um, the summer of 2020 and the racial reckoning that the country was going through. When uh, the momentum for racial impact statements uh, was started in Iowa, that was in response to a national report that the sentencing project uh, published that generated a lot of attention in the state, creating that momentum, creating that pressure. And I think at the end of the day, racial impact statements offer a legislative solution, a political solution to addressing racial disparity in the criminal justice system. As they're currently adopted in the states where they're in place in Iowa, Connecticut, Oregon, New Jersey, Maryland, this year, Maine and Virginia also joined Maryland in enacting racial impact statements. These policies are prospective. They are, these statements are generated either before deliberation in the legislative hearing or after the uh, proposed sentencing measures have cleared a legislative hearing before they're heard on the legislative floor, on a chamber floor, either in the House or the Senate. Um, as lawmakers deliberate on proposed sentencing laws. You know, we published a report earlier this year that also highlights the per, um, pervasiveness of racial disparity in state imprisonment and continued to find high rates of disparity in states like Wisconsin and other states as well, including New Jersey, which has a racial impact statement policy. So, you know, it, it points to the fact that racial impact statements are a legislative solution, something concrete, something specific that lawmakers can support, can enact in order to address the pervasiveness of racial disparities in the criminal legal system. It also points to the fact that it's one tool in the overall toolbox around addressing racial disparity and hopefully undoing it. So in addition to the laws that are currently on the books, considering racial impact statements that are retroactive is also um, a policy that some states are considering. You know, there's been a range of racial impact statements that have been introduced and the provisions or mechanisms included in them ranges. Um, again, looking at bills that are currently on the books and addressing racial impact statements or supporting racial impact statements to look at those retroactive policies is a policy solution that some legislators are looking at. Identifying racial impact statements that once they find a racial disparity in the proposed legislation and uh, require some sort of corrective action for the legislation, either the lawmakers have to um, address the underlying causes that contribute to the proposed disparity or state for the record why they think the legislation should move forward 
are also provisions in racial impact statement bills that have been introduced and advanced around the states. So there's a range of mechanisms within these racial impact statements, but I think the big picture um, solution that folks in the audience should note is that they offer something concrete for lawmakers to consider in addressing the racial disparities that are found to be so pervasive in America's criminal legal system. So we just um, heard that was a really helpful overview of the different kinds of um, mechanisms that can be built into these statements, um, which of course vary from place to place. And so um, we'd love to bring uh, Ms. Tucker in at this point because um, among other work, um, she published a study of the Iowa racial impact statement legislation and her um, report offers a series of considerations based on the experience of that state for subsequent racial impact statement efforts. And so Ms. Tucker, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what do we know about promising strategies for racial impact statements and also where there might be some room for um, improvement in policy or practice moving forward? Yes, uh, thank you, Leah. And thank you to the Urban Institute for putting this together and having us all here today. Um, I, I work with the National Juvenile Justice Network, and so the report, um, the promise of uh, racial impact statements in Iowa, um, really came out of a response to our members. We're an organization made up of state-based um, advocacy organizations, and um, so it really kind of came out of the question around, you know, are, how are these working? You know, should we really be advocating for these in our states? And so. Um, our racial justice committee sort of reached out to the University of Iowa and their College of Law. And there were some students there that were part of the Community Law Empowerment Project that really did the research and analyzed you know, all of um, Iowa's uh, racial impact statements to, um, to produce this report and come out with the takeaways um, that we found. And so the, there were three major takeaways from our report. And the first, um, was just that um, the uh, racial impact statements need to be available both to legislators and the community um, in the a, a timely manner within the process. Um, so um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, some of the uh, the racial impact statements are after the bills have already sort of passed out of committee or. or before the hearing. And so it's past the time when the public is able to really sort of offer any sort of public um, input into the bills or to really have conversations with legislators around um, the impact that what they're proposing will have. And so we, what we found was that the earlier that that could happen in the process, um, the better the discussion could be, the better um, information that both the community and advocates have to either advocate for or against legislation. Um, the second um, major takeaway that we found with regard to there being sort of a thorough and comprehensive analysis for the way that, you know, the, the bills are sort of put together. Um, what we found um, in Iowa was that, you know, you know, at one point they were really sort of robust and it included a lot of analysis, but sort of as the years went on, they started to, um, to get a, a little more sparse and um, had started to reference back to sort of a um, general sort of a census memo. And so what we found was that there really needs to be a, you know, a solid methodology and um, for, for creating these statements. And then the last takeaway that we had um, was that even though a bill would have a negative impact on a minority population, that those bills would still sometimes pass. And so what we also, we also recommended from the report was that um, if a bill is going to have a negative impact, that there would be some sort of a mechanism in place for that not to not to occur. Um, I think we all know how difficult it would be for a, a negative fiscal impact statement um, associated with a bill to get that passed. And so just also um, to keep that in mind, um, that any sort of a negative impact would potentially bar um, legislation. Um, from being passed. And so those were sort of the three major takeaways. We had um, a series of additional recommendations that I could maybe speak to a little later, but, um, but that was um, the, the three major findings from our report. Thank you for um, overviewing those. And we'll definitely circle back on several several of those themes um, in a little bit. Um, I'd love to bring um, Delegate Lewis into the conversation at this point and talk a little bit about um, process and um, different approaches to um, 
implementing racial impact statement provisions because um, Delegate Lewis, thanks to the efforts of you and your colleagues, uh, Maryland, as we mentioned, is one of the most recent states to adopt a racial impact statement process. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what that journey was like and why um, specifically in a more administrative route ended up being the best path forward in your state specifically. Thank you, Leah. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, uh, uh, Wayne, for, for spearheading this uh, to begin with in Iowa and everyone who's part of that uh, campaign. Thank you to, to Nicole, uh, who's been a soldier in this fight, definitely with me in Maryland, but I know with others across this country. Uh, and I appreciate the 315 people who are on here right now who saw it not robbery to have a conversation about racial equity in America. Uh, I think that is a good sign, not just for us, but um, for our children who are uh, to come after us. Um, our process got started. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I got elected and I went to a room and we started talking about enhanced sentencing. And I knew from data provided by the Sentencing Project and others that it would lead to uh, increased incarceration of uh, Black and Brown men in Maryland. Uh, and as I started having this conversation with a number of my colleagues and advocates in Annapolis, um, they kind of felt like, well, Jazz, that's your opinion. They didn't validate the research because they thought the research was biased, okay? Um, as one of the few people in you know, that age group who uh, still have to deal uh, with law enforcement you know, when they don't know I'm a legislator or what have you. Um, you know, I, I, I thought that this is something I needed to champion and work on. We went the administrative route because to be frank, it was the only way it was gonna move. <laughs> uh, in, in any type of political process, you gotta push and pull to see what's viable. We, we started with a bill. Um, the presiding officers at the time uh, didn't think that was the appropriate route. Um, you know, we in, in, in Maryland, we have uh, our fiscal notes that evaluate bills also have a small business impact. And they just decided to do that through um, essentially an administrative decree, so to speak, by the presiding officers. So they wanted to go a similar route for racial impact statements. The problem we had, though, was how. Uh, one presiding officer of the House uh, essentially said, Jazz, we can do this if you can figure out how we can do it without having to hire more staff. And I said, great. So I went out and found amazing academics at our state-based institutions uh, from Bowie State University to University of Maryland College Park and others who had offered their both their time and experience, but also their graduate students uh, to lend their time and energy. Um, the other presiding officer didn't agree with that idea because he felt like ultimately uh, our public state institutions are a branch of the executive branch. And uh, we would be then handing off our a degree of announcing our policies to folks who could be influenced by the governor. Uh, I reassured them that all academics had a standard that they had to adhere to for their own credibility, uh, but that didn't work. Uh, one of the things that really helped us, I had a great relationship with both of our presiding officers, um, uh, former Speaker Mike Bush, former Senate President uh, Mike Miller. They both passed away since we started this campaign, and uh, one was replaced by the first uh, woman and person of color to be the Speaker of the House of Delegates, Adrian Jones, uh, and I helped preside over her election, uh, as well as Senate President Bill Ferguson, who's the second youngest uh, Senate President of Maryland's history. And I think with that change of having different folks kind of guiding the ship, uh, they, they saw the, the vision and the need. Uh, so I worked with them on putting together a balance where they still did hire staff internal uh, to focus on this with partnership with a lot of the legwork coming from academic consultants uh, at state-based institutions. And it it was very helpful. Uh, we piloted on uh, a number of bills. You know, Maryland passed the most comprehensive police reform package uh, this year, largely based off the data that came from the racial impact statements on how uh, not just police arrests, but police complaints were coming from certain people and that they weren't being followed up on. And when our nonpartisan legislative staff started producing it, no one could refute it, right? So then when we were saying that, you know, sentences of life without the possibility of parole 
uh, 81% of that were going to uh, black youth. And now Maryland has the highest incarceration of, of, of black people in the state, you know, not somewhere in the deep south, Maryland, right next to DC. Uh, that, that started to, I think, influence a lot of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, because they, they felt that, um, look, if this isn't biased, this is just the data, right? And there's nothing compulsory to make us, you know, uh, force mitigating language, I think, to um, Professor Tucker's point, uh, but just having it available, I think, was a big change uh, in the dialogue from before when we had it. I'd like to follow up quickly on the, the process question because I'm certainly I think that's that's emerged um, throughout um, each of the, the speakers' comments so far is that um, the um, the details really matter in these statements in terms of how they are created and um, and what that analysis looks like. Um, and so I'd like to um, pose this question to um, uh, Mr. Ford and Ms. Porter um, for starters, although others, please feel free to, to jump in because one of the key challenges, as I'm sure many folks who have tuned, tuned into this webinar are aware, um, when working on criminal justice policy is that um, data quality can be really challenging. Um, we know that criminal justice processes are very fragmented um, across the local and state levels and data collection really varies. Um, so I'm wondering what are some key considerations for um, ensuring that we have the information needed to evaluate where a given proposal might have um, a racially disparate outcome? Nicole, I'll let you start that off. Great, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I think there are multiple solutions that could get to that answer, Leah. One, um, a series of them could be statutorily requiring data collection at certain um, aspects throughout the criminal legal system. I know one, um, uh, one idea that's come up in other conversations that I've had around this, um, particularly with Latinx researchers and um, advocates, given the uh, poor data quality of um, you know, people in the system who are Latinx, is to require um, data collection in a way that's more standardized to improve um, the data quality. Uh, data collection, racial demographic data collection at different points in the criminal legal system uh, could uh, perhaps improve the data that's available so that uh, racial impact statements when required and generated can be more robust and pull um, from available data sources to provide more comprehensive estimates, more comprehensive projections. So, you know, racial, again, racial impact statements are one aspect of this conversation, one part of this conversation. There's others, including improving the data collection amongst different criminal legal agencies, amongst um, different criminal legal uh, practitioners within states so that the data that is available that is analyzed in service of producing a forecasting estimate is sound quality, is pulled from sound quality and can help um, produce the most comprehensive and robust uh, projection possible. And um, you know, then making that data widely available, not just to uh, the agency charged or tasked with producing the racial impact statements, but also to the general public at large so that that information can help influence the various practices that go into criminal legal policy making and also help the public um, you know, review and observe what is actually happening in the criminal legal system, not just within states, but also across states and nationally as well. Go. Uh, we were very fortunate here in Iowa back in uh, probably about 2003, 2004. Uh, I remember uh, giving a lot of money to a criminal justice data warehouse. And I, I criticized that as a state legislator because I said, we got a lot of issues going on. I, mean, I don't care about stats. I got all these people being locked up. It's one of the greatest decisions I ever made because Iowa has one of the oldest and the best, all those I mean, it's old and antiquated now, but we still got it. We got a criminal justice data warehouse that other people from around the world has called and asked us how you do it. 
as, as Tracy Tucker knows, the reason why she chose Iowa because we had more minority impact statement documentation than anyone else in America. So that was critical. And I tell people as I travel the country, if you don't have a warehouse, if you don't have a connection to a university, and I understand what the state of Maryland is doing, all those dynamics, it's no way you can have good intentions, but you're not going to get off a of first base because you're going to have information that you cannot get. So again, looking back on it, I had no idea in funding this because it took a lot of money. And funding that criminal justice warehouse is one of the reasons why I think that Iowa has come a long way in that area. How we do it here, it's automatic in the legislation. Any bill that goes to the floor, before it goes to the floor, it goes to committee. Criminal justice, it goes to committee. If it comes out of committee with a yes vote, it gets to the committee. And before it gets to the floor, it's automatic. A, a legislator does not have to ask. The statute said you got to put a minority impact statement connected to that, just like a fiscal note or any other note. So I was a little bit unique. And again, that's I did that in 2008. That was a long time ago. If I had to do it right now, I would put juveniles, I would do a lot of other things that we can talk about later if I had a chance to go back in time. But the bottom line is, is that it's automatic and we got a computer system that I think is very helpful. And so, so anybody's interested in doing this, you got to have data collection. If not, you would you 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 can't even get off a of first base. Absolutely. So the there's questions that um, um come up certainly about you know data quality, data transparency, data availability. And another thing that I heard um several people mention was the and the analytical partnerships and figuring out who has capacity to really um, take those data and, and perform the analysis and, and do those in a timely way, as, as Ms. Tucker mentioned. And so, um, Delegate Lewis, I'd be really curious to hear a little bit more about the partnerships that you described with the um, academic institutions and sort of what, what that looks like. And also, um, Ms. Tucker, if you have any um, perspectives or, or things to add in terms of the um, analytical capacity and, and really making sure that when data are available, that they are analyzed and, and that the impact statements have um, really meaningful results to inform policy. I think that is, um, I, I think what Wayne just mentioned was critically important on not just having a, a place to store the data, but uh, readily available access uh, to that data. Uh, because sometimes the folks who your bill's affecting may, have, may be sitting on that data, right? And they may not be willing uh, to share it let's say if it's Department of Corrections or Public Safety in Maryland's case, and they know that we're about to um, change some, some policies that they disagree with, right? It could be difficult for the academics to get it. I think that's part of the reason why being tied to academic institutions are so key, because they have other data sets that they are already have access to that's important. So our pipeline, the way it worked was when we originally had the bill, we were gonna work with uh, an entity called LASER, uh, the Lab for Applied Social Science Research that's based out of uh, the sociology department at the University of Maryland College Park, headed by Dr. Rayshawn Ray, who's now a, like a, a Brookings Institution uh, Robenstein Fellow. And um, that ended up not working because he was going over to Brookings, so he couldn't focus himself. Uh, so the internal uh, for our Department of Legislative Services, the, the policy staffer we hired was essentially his protege uh, to run the program internally. And, and it worked out well, because you know, we don't talk about this enough, but like, I think efforts like this is important for us building a bench uh, for people who know how to do this, who can then get into institutions across the country uh, and, and help us out. Uh, but so his protege went inside and was like our internal person. But then we set up a, a contractual relationship with academics at uh, Bowie State University, which is a historically black college and university here in Maryland, uh, as well as University of, of Maryland, Baltimore, the Schaefer Center, which is based in Baltimore as well. And they together partnered in doing a lot of the legwork. Um, we didn't make ours so that the bill had to, um, the, the impact statement had to be present before a hearing. Um, and Part of the reason why we did that for us is in Maryland, any bill that's introduced is entitled to a hearing. Uh, but people can introduce a thousand versions of the same bill, okay? Um, so what we decided to do then was to address bills, but also just issues, understanding that there may be different takes on the same issue. 
And once that bill is introduced, uh, they will create a racial impact statement based on that bill. And if other bills are very similar to it, uh, they will tie into them and just, they'll essentially edit the impact statement to reference all the different versions uh, instead of having, um, it, it, it was just a, an efficiency thing for time um, uh, purposes that worked out. We did dedicate resources too, or we hired someone, you know, the contractual relationship, folks are getting paid for that. So that takes some commitment from leadership uh, on top. Uh, we started as a pilot, as, as Leah said, when she introduced me, like I would love for us to take this beyond the criminal justice space into education and healthcare, um, as well as addressing the climate crisis uh, that disproportionately affects low income and minority communities. Uh, but you take what you can get, right? Uh, and once we continue to prove the concept, I think we can push, push, push uh, to expand, um, you know, what falls underneath that umbrella. I just wanted to add something in. You know, I think what Deli Lewis um, mentions, particularly in the context of every bill introduced in Maryland is entitled to a hearing, speaks to the specific nuances and policy and policy making from state to state. So whatever the racial impact statement policy or practice is within a particular state will have to be specific to that state. And then also thinking through what capacity is currently available, how to operationalize that capacity in service of making racial impact statements available in a way that these forecasting tools could be used in policymaking. I mean, the purpose is again, to forecast what the potential impact of proposed sentencing laws. And you know, this conversation is specific to proposed sentencing laws. Over the years, I have been a part of broader conversations where um, you know, practitioners and policy advocates from different uh, social service sectors were involved as well. But this uh, focus is specific to criminal legal policy. So how to create statements that can help uh, d deliberation around proposed sentencing laws and, and what is the infrastructure, what is the capacity in place within the state as advocates, as lawmakers, as the practitioners think through how to operationalize the development of them and also to make use of them in deliberating on proposed policy. Also, you know, what I mentioned in my opening comments is we hope to expand upon the practice of racial impact statements. So it's not just about prospective legislation, but it's also about uh, creating statements that can retroactively review the policies and practices that are currently in place and contribute to racial disparities in a state's prison system or other aspects of criminal legal policy within a state and to help repair the harm associated with the policies that have been in place for the last 30 to 40 years and then have worked at exacerbating racial disparities. But you know, in some of the questions offered um, already, you know, people are asking, well, who exactly does racial impact statements? Um, who can we work with to do racial impact statements? As we've seen from the experiences that uh, Mr. Ford and Delegate Lewis have shared, these conversations are specific to the state. In, developing sort of these technical answers to these questions, happy to work with anyone who wants to think through intentionally how to apply this within the state, but it is presumably gonna be very specific to the state, although there are best practices to pull out, um, particularly looking at Ms. Tucker's report and some of the best practices that have already um, been shared this afternoon. If, if, I'm, if I may add, um... The only thing I, I wanted to add, and uh, Nicole remind me of it, you know, as you guys start working in various states or institutions to implement, you know, uh, racial equity in any form, you know, anticipate some pushback, right? And not even from people who you would assume. It's, it's some people who, you know, one of the biggest, uh, I guess, areas we got pushback from in Maryland was the nonpartisan staff themselves, because the presumption that they didn't understand racial equity analysis, they were offended by. And that took us a while to just get past that. And we, and we essentially were saying, we aren't implying that you are racist because you don't um, do this, um, or you haven't been asked of this. We're just saying it should be done, you know? 
and um, there, there will be institutional barriers that we all have to address. Like any family, you know, you kind of have to close the doors from time to time and have a family conversation, uh, you know, to move forward. Uh, but I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's critically important. We actually started before, the way actually Nicole and I got connected, I introduced a bill originally requiring all of the um, executive branch departments to have an equity officer. Uh, so that before they promulgate rules or regulations, they had to review it from that, you know, and um, folks started talking about fiscal notes, and not being able to afford a bunch of equity offices, blah, blah, blah. So that, so we re-strategized, so like, well, if we can't get it for the executive branch at large, how about we start with the legislative branch? And that's how we got uh, connected. And um, you just have to be really flexible for your state and where you're at in your organization. Definitely want to circle back to that question of sort of mitigating challenges with these with these types of policies. But before we before we get there, um, one um, theme that's really been emerging is all of the different applications of equity impact statements, um, both in terms of the the piece of the policy process they can inform as well as the topics. And so I um, wanted to make sure that we turn to. Um, Ms. Tucker, because we've largely been focusing in this conversation so far on the adult legal system, but NJJN, of course, works on youth justice reform efforts around the country, and um, we all know that the juvenile justice system has similar challenges with systemic racism, and that actually disproportionality has increased as the number of um, incarcerated youth has shrunk over the past few decades. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, Ms. Tucker, are lawmakers using racial impact analyses for juvenile justice policymaking as well? And um, where might there be potential to strengthen this type of analysis in the youth justice space specifically? Oh, yes. Thank you again, Leah. Um, so there are a few states that have included um, juvenile justice in their statutes. So um, New Jersey isn't included in it. Um, I believe it's Oregon is looking to consider child welfare. Um, Maine has sort of left it open to kind of see what systems can be impacted by their racial impact statements. But I really wanted to sort of highlight um, some bills that took place actually in Maryland in Montgomery County. Um, there were um, a few bills around um, school resource officers. And so there was a bill to um, end the program of um, school resource officers. And then there was one you know, in, in support of. So it was to eliminate and then a, an opposing bill to support. And so their um, Office of Legislative Services produced their um, racial equity and social justice impact statements around um, these two issues and um, the the statement that was calling for the continued use of the program really did a very thorough analysis as we've been already discussing um, and found that um, black students represented 22% of that Montgomery County public school population, um, but were 43% of the suspensions, 45% of the student arrest, um, that low income students and students with disabilities were overrepresented among school suspensions. Um, boys um, with uh, disabilities were also overrepresented and black boys were also overrepresented. And so that the, the, the report, the statement actually really went on to really um, give sort of like a literature review um, with regard to sort of like best practices and examining the differences of um, outcomes of race of behaviors across race. And um, then they went on to, and, and again, do some more analysis of their own um, Montgomery public school data. And so the, the conclusion from that statement um, with regard to supporting the program was that the SRO program um, may have an unintended impact of reducing safety and security of the Black, low-income, male, and students of disabilities by criminalizing behaviors and actions that would best be warranted, you know, dealt with through their, their uh, code of conduct, right? Um, and then, and then the statement actually went on to sort of identify what some of those best practices were um, to, to handle these behaviors with regard to um, more counselors in schools, um, using the positive behavioral interventions and supports, um, more social emotional learning, restorative justice practices. And so um, in the ways that the, the, this racial impact statement in support of, likewise, the one against it sort of um, 
highlighted some of the same type of data um, and concluded that um, to eliminate the program would likely enhance racial equity and social justice in Montgomery County. And so neither of those bills ended up moving forward, but what it offered was an opportunity for you know, the uh, council members to really have some robust discussion about you know, what was happening in their counties, what was happening in their schools. And I do believe they sort of established uh, um, a committee or, or something with some young people involved to sort of look at how it is that they're going to address, you know, discipline in the schools. And so it's both an example of really what we've been talking about of having that thorough um, uh, analysis of the bills and also a way that it was able to kind of have a public, um, a positive impact in our youth justice space as well. So That's a great example of a, um, a very current and ongoing, um, evolving kind of issue, um, and really makes me think about the role of um, racial impact statement policies in shaping conversations and making sure that these issues are really on, on the table when um, policy conversations and debates are happening. Um, and I'd love to pose a question kind of broadly to the group. Um, perhaps, Ms. Porter, if you might want to jump in first. Um, really thinking about kind of where we are in public policy making broadly and the connection between this racial impact conversation and the broader racial justice movement um, and asking if is there kind of a, a limit to what we can accomplish through racial impact statements specifically and what else do we need to be thinking about um, perhaps in addition to impact statements or other alternatives in order to really um, improve equity and justice policy making. And it looks like there have been some comments um, in the chat as well about the sort of the, the then what conversation and how do we keep um, policies that um, really do seem like they would have harmful impacts from, from moving forward. Yeah, no, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, I mean, I think since racial impact statements were first adopted in Iowa in since there has been questions um, from across the political and ideological spectrum in, curse, in terms of their utility and purpose, particularly given the research found in Iowa, that when they were first developed, the statements were robust and um, later in the process, in later years, the um, information has become more standardized with the question towards um, you know, I would say the underlying sort of analysis and in spirit of generating them with the goal of um, addressing policy deliberation. You know, I think in some states, and this comes from a conversation that um, I and Mr. Ford were at, um, you know, almost 10 years ago, where we talked with advocates and other lawmakers who had champion racial impact statements. When they first got adopted in states like Connecticut, um, they were also, they were adopted in a political atmosphere where a great deal of criminal legal reform was also being introduced and being deliberated on, so, you know, more than 20, almost 30 years into the era of mass incarceration. In states like Connecticut, um, credible legislation was introduced and has since been adopted to help that state scale back its prison population. And Connecticut is amongst a handful of states that have reduced its prison population by over 30% since it peaked in the mid 2000s. Well, racial impact statements being adopted and operationalized in the context of that helped to chill regressive legislation that was also introduced at the time. And in my understanding from advocates who worked with racial impact statements and worked with other efforts to address um, the scale of imprisonment in Connecticut is that the policy um, as it stands helped to slow down bad bills that were introduced. So, you know, that is an important outcome of racial impact statements, given how we know mandatory minimums and other regressive policies were adopted in the mid 80s and 90s, contributing to the number of um, you know, laws and practices that lengthened uh, prison sentences and increased the likelihood that people uh, would be in prison once they came in contact with the police. So that's a part of this conversation as well, in addition to what racial impact statements are and you know, how they're written, how the analysis they offer and the um, forecasting 
that they provide in deliberating on proposed um, law. So how the tools might be used in helping to slow down regressive bills is something that advocates and practitioners in Connecticut report is certainly an outcome of racial impact statements being available. And it's something for us to explore in other jurisdictions as well. And Nicole, I'd like to follow up on that. We and I were, uh, I just read some recent research on, in a mag national magazine, Senator Young out of Oklahoma uh, did some research. We talked to him um, here and I'm very happy to say I was no longer number one in incarceration of blacks. Wisconsin, my sister state, is number one. I was number six. When I did this 2008, that's past a decade ago, if we're gonna look at that average about every 10 years, you'll go down three or four numbers. But again, I look at that two ways. If I was a younger man, I would say, you gotta, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's, I can't wait. I'd be dead and gone by the time we get equity in this country. But I'm not a younger man, I'm an older man. And wisdom is wisdom. We are no longer number one. Now I wanna say that the bill that I authored was the major reason, but I'm, but I'm not that ignorant. But I am gonna say that the bill I authored, the authored in the fifth widest state was some of the reason why we gone from number one to number six. So as we begin this journey, as, as, as Leah said, every state, and Nicole, every state got its own journey. And I got that. I mean, I'm in Iowa. I'm not in, I'm not in you know, uh, Kentucky or other states. But we have set an example. And, and as I, with two things I build upon that. We have named the institute in my name. We got together here in Iowa. And we look at what, what we did many years ago. And we look at the momentum. So it's called the Wayne Ford Equity Impact Institute, uh, based on the language that we've done. And we, and we have contacted, as of right now, all the states in America besides three. We've developed relationships. California even did a resolution and mentioned the state of Iowa. They, I didn't say a bill, I said they did a resolution because their dynamics is much different. So I'm very happy that we have a movement and I'm very happy that the Urban Institute have, has gotten us together. And that actually speaks to another question that's coming in in the audience Q&A, which is just a little bit about sort of what what the national um, landscape looks like for um, related to kind of advocacy around this issue and what might be some um, suggestions for ways that um, webinar attendees might be able to plug in or get more involved. And I'll open that to any. Well, um, you know, this year, I counted at least 14 states that had racial impact statement bills introduced, including Maryland and um, states where they got adopted, including, and we've talked about this Maine and Virginia. But even in the states where they're currently in place, coalitions that can help make use of them, I think this is a finding coming out of your report, Tracy, um, can help use them to help change the conversation. Hopefully, again, stop bad bills that would exacerbate disparities. And then also thinking about um, prospective legislation that might help ameliorate the disparities as well. So not just coalitions to get them enacted, but coalitions to, to use, make use of them, which I think is some, a strength that that report um, found in Iowa. But in states where there are proposed uh, bills, Wisconsin, um, Oklahoma, it would be great to have the support of folks in the audience, particularly those from those states, support advocacy coalitions to help get these um, policies enacted and then once enacted to help make use of them. If I, if I may, I'll say two things. Uh, uh, first, I 100% agree with Nicole per usual. Um, that uh, we should make use of these. Everyone should use them. It normalized is it. In Maryland, we start off as a pilot, right? So I think the more that other partners leverages the data in reports that's, um, uh, that's been published, it moves it from being a pilot to a permanent thing, right? Um, the other thing is that as more and more states start to implement racial impact statements, it creates a climate where nationally that just becomes the norm. You know, and that can be even a conversation we have uh, in the halls of Congress. Uh, I know when I win my race, I plan to work on this. Uh, but uh, just generally speaking, it should be second nature in America for us to have equity conversations as everything that we do. 
Um, and I think that would be critically important. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna take my, my second part from what Wayne said, you know, as, as a younger man, um, uh, I want Iowa to drop, you know, further, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna help you with that. And I, and I think uh, I have a one-year-old baby boy. I don't want, uh, you know, him experiencing the same inequities uh, that I experienced. And I'm sure more that Wayne experienced, you know, the people who are listening on here. So I think we need to work with the fierce urgency of now uh, to pass this in, in more states. Representative Lewis, there is some movement at the federal level. As Nicole know, we have spoke to Congress, we have got movement, but uh, it's kind of hard building a consensus, but there is movement as we continue this coalition, we can all get together, but there is movement on Capitol Hill regarding this. We are um, reaching the end of an, our hour together and have um, covered an enormous amount of ground. And I just want to express my um, huge gratitude to the panelists for being part of this discussion and also just um, open up the floor for a quick um, round of, of um, 30 second or one minute um, closing remarks for anything you'd really like to leave the audience with, including um, kind of what, where you see as the future for this um, equity impact statement um, movement and any other suggestions for how to get involved or learn more. It's time to sing your citizen. Stop laughing, Nicole. It's the time to sing your citizen. Let me be candid. I'll make it quick. You know, 1969, I got a football scholarship from the inner city of Washington, D.C. to play football in Minnesota. And then I came out here and I, all my black friends left. They said, Wayne, why you want to stay out here? You know what I mean? You from the hood. You from Chocolate City. This is 1969. But that was a long time ago. It's one of the best decisions I've made. Because when I became the legislator in Iowa, I became the 10th Black legislator in the history of Iowa. But the bottom line is this, I and my white colleagues made a difference. So I'm from the hood. You know, I, used to be, not, I know about juvenile crime. I did bad things in DC when I was a kid. But what I'm trying to say is, I don't care where you are. I mean, I'm in Iowa, I'm in the fifth white. If I was gonna let the color stop me, I wouldn't even try to be a legislator, let alone do a historical bill. I'm a clear example, and I was talking to you the same way I talk on Capitol Hill. The same intensity doesn't change. I am who I am. You can make a difference regardless where you are. Please keep that in mind. Thank you very much. I'll just add that, and I think you got at this with an earlier question, Leah, but there's no doubt that this year, and I guess we didn't really hear from you, Adelia Lewis, about this specifically, but that this year, um, you know, the impact of 2020 really influenced the political climate coming into this year. And the issue is, is like, what are concrete things that we can do to address the pervasive racial disparities in the criminal legal system and perhaps other areas of social policy, given some of the questions, racial impact statements for housing, racial impact statements for education. These are one tool. They're not the only tool. They're not the panacea to racism, to structural racism in the United States. We want to work with folks on these tools and other tools, including repealing mandatory minimums, including expanding alternatives for people who would otherwise be bound for prison, given the racial disparity in prison admissions across the country. There's a range of things that we should be working on, but racial impact statements are one tool to address that. Yeah, it was a, um, this is, this is, this is a powerful year. Uh, I'll, I'll end uh, with this, like I said, uh, in 2019, I, I buried my dad, found out that my uh, wife was pregnant with our baby boy who we named after my father. And um, as, as we as a society have been grappling with all the systemic inequities, I am, I think like most parents out there, obsessed with trying to make a a better world selfishly for my child um, as well as yours. So um, I think we need to stay in this fight. Racial impact statements is uh, to Nicole point one of many tools that we should use, but it is a key one because it takes away any arguments that folks would have against change once you see the data. You know, um, knowledge is power. It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, and not long ago, uh, knowledge was hoarded from certain groups of people. Uh, so 
Uh, let's leverage it. Let's expand access to that knowledge. Let's, you know, leverage the center uh, that's named in, in Wayne's honor. Um, I think that will be key. Thank you to the Urban Institute for bringing us together. Uh, and thank you to uh, the 213 people who have stayed on <laughs> to the end. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't have any additional comments to add to that, um, Leah. I believe everyone has already said it, everything that I already would have said, um, essentially, um, with a you know call to for justice from coming out of 2020. That you know, let's just look at how it is that we can use racial impact statements to kind of make a difference across systems. Thanks so much to um, again to all of these incredible panelists for this um, really um, wonderful discussion, giving us a, a lot of food for thought and some great calls to action. And just as a reminder um, for the viewers, we'll be posting the video of this conversation and also following up over email with some related resources. So um, thank you all so much for coming and thanks for your engagement on this issue and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.